the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> we find ourselves on Thursday which means it's football day and it's a great matchup coming on tonight but we'll get to that in a second first let me welcome you to the program you are in the lab room I'm your host Luke thank you for joining me and this is going to be a great matchup tonight on Thursday night football now I know I said that two weeks ago when the St. Louis Rams were hosting the Arizona Cardinals the last time we had an NFC West matchup on Thursday Night Football. And I thought that one was going to be splendid. I was wrong. This time, however, I feel pretty confident in my assessment that this is going to be a very good watch. This is going to be a very good football game between two good teams that play plenty of defense. If you're not a defensive-minded Fan, if you don't like to see a defensive struggle, if, you're, if your heart is weak and you can't take hard hits, then you need to turn away. Don't turn it to NFL Network at 8.30 tonight because it's going to be a very physical football game between two teams who play enough defense to spread around the whole NFC conference. These teams get after it defensively. Last week going into play, the Seahawks were number one in defense. The 49ers were number two. Now, those numbers have changed over the past weekend because of last week's results in those games. However, these are two gritty, grimy, very physical, and flat-out good defenses in the National Football League. I venture to say that these are two of the top three premier defenses in the league. I don't care what order you put them in, whether they're one, two, or two and three, or one and three, these two teams are going to be in that top three discussion when talking about premier elite defenses in the National Football League for the 2012 season. And I myself, I'm a big fan of this Seattle Seahawks defense. Not many times you're going to get me to be able to sit down and watch a Seattle Seahawks game and actually be entertained. Are you not entertained? Yes, I am entertained by this Seattle Seahawks defense. Hell, if, if I didn't see the Seattle Seahawks on offense the whole game, it wouldn't make me one bit of difference. I really am enamored with this defense because how often is it that you get a 6-4 corner on one side, a 6-3 corner on the other side, a 6-4 safety in the backfield, and another ball hawking safety that's the only one under 6 feet? But he's just as ferocious, just as big a playmaker as the other three in the secondary, if not bigger. So, this Seattle Seahawks secondary, I think, is what makes them as good as they are. But they're not to be outdone by that defensive line. That defensive line gets after the quarterback. Bruce Irvin, who everyone thought was, was a reach, you know, at 14 or wherever the Seahawks took him in the first round. You know, a lot of people, a lot of pundits would say, oh, this is a bad... I'm a big proponent of, if you feel highly about someone, if you feel strong about a, a player coming out of college, he's your guy. I don't care where everyone has him going in the draft, what's his grade, where he's supposed to go. If that's your man, you have a pick, go get him. I don't care where you are. I don't care if they're saying he's a third-round grade. You had a first-round pick? You think he's a first-round talent? You take him. You don't know what anybody else is thinking. You don't know someone else could be hot on this trail. You wait. Oh, we can get him in the second round. Somebody, someone else snatches him up in the first round. You never know what everyone else is thinking. It shouldn't matter. If your guy is there, 
You like them, you take them. And that's what the Seahawks did with Bruce Irvin. And it is paying dividends as he has been an absolute monster out there at defensive end, especially in pass rushing downs when he can pin his ears back and go after the quarterback. He has been phenomenal. Nothing short of phenomenal this year for the Seattle Seahawks. And right across from him, Chris Clemens, who he was a journeyman for the, for the first part of his career. And he's found his stride. I mean, he was once a Redskin, an Oakland Raider, a Philadelphia Eagle. But I'll tell you what, I think the reason that he never really got to flourish in any of those situations was because I was talking to a friend of mine, and I think he made a great point. Everyone put him in a box. Everybody said, you're a third down pass rusher. You're a specialist. You can't play on all three downs. Well, Chris Clemens told the Seattle Seahawks, I can play on all three downs. Just give me a shot. I can do it. They put their faith in him. They put him in for all three downs, and he's been nothing short of remarkable for the Seattle Seahawks. He can contain the rush. He can get to the passer, and he is... One of the biggest disruptors on that defensive line for the Seattle Seahawks. And that line gets pressure. They force errant passes. And this is why this defense is so good because they work in unison. The front four gets pressure. That pressure forces bad throws, which the secondary is already playing airtight coverage anyhow. And now they get a chance to make a play on the ball on an errant pass. And they're going to make a play. This secondary does not waste opportunities to make plays. That's what I love about this Seattle Seahawks defense. They're very opportunistic. When there are plays there to be made, they make them. Which is what the 49ers did a year ago, which is what they're not doing this year. That's why I think the Seattle Seahawks are this year's San Francisco 49ers in terms of defense. Now you look at the other side of the football at the San Francisco 49ers, the home team in this game. They're still a good football team. Now, they did have a very, very crushing loss a week ago where they were just manhandled, dominated, and out San Francisco 49ers in that game against the, the Giants a week ago. The, the Giants basically said to the 49ers, we're just going to manhandle you up front. They put their big personnel in just like the 49ers like to do extra linemen, put in big guys, and said, we're going to run the football. We're going to smash mouth you, just as you do to your opponents. We're going to see how you like it being done to you. It's time for you to have a dose of your own medicine. 49ers didn't like it too much. They played suffocating defense, forcing Alex Smith into three turnovers, ran the football with Ahmad Bradshaw, got over 100 yards on this very stingy, San Francisco 49ers rush defense and piled up 26 points. Something that the 49ers normally do. That's their recipe for success. Stop the run, which they did against, the Giants did against the 49ers. They limited Frank Gore to next to nothing. Stop the run, make you one-dimensional, make you take to the air, then force you into mistakes, which the Giants did against the 49ers, forcing Alex Smith into three interceptions. Turn those interceptions, those turnovers into points, which the Giants did, scoring 13 points off of those three 49er turnovers. So they did everything that the 49ers normally do to their opponents. The Giants did to the 49ers. And so I think it was a wake-up call for the 49ers. That's their second time losing this season to a team that basically did to them what they normally do to others. The Vikings did it to them early on in the season. And that one you were able to kind of brush aside because you said, okay, they were due for one. They hadn't turned the football over in ages. They went on the road in a hostile environment. And they lost. It happens. But this one was at home. This one was at home against a team that ended your season a year ago. And so that revenge factor was supposed to be great. You were supposed to be coming into this game out for revenge. So you are supposed to be playing at your best. You know this is one of the teams that if you're trying to get where you want to go, which is to the Super Bowl, you're probably going to have to go through this football team in the Giants. And so we were expecting the best of the 49ers. And what we got was a very lackluster performance, which leads a lot of people to believe that the 49ers aren't as good as we once thought in this season. 
Well, I don't know if I'm going to go as far as to say that the 49ers aren't as good as we thought. But I will say that they do have a problem on that team. One that's not going to go away this year. And it's going to linger throughout the remainder of this season. And probably, I think, will be addressed next season. But they can't do anything about it now. And this problem that I'm referring to is Alex Smith. What the 49ers have to realize, and I'm pretty sure they already knew this, is that they can't fall behind in football games. They don't have the quarterback that can bring them from behind. See, in that game last season in the playoffs against the New Orleans Saints, Alex Smith was able to bring this 49ers team back several times in that game after trailing late in the ball game to bring the 49ers back to win. And so that kind of quieted down a lot of the naysayers that said Alex Smith couldn't get it done in a critical situation. I still wasn't buying it because at that moment, that was a very good comeback. That was a very good showing by Alex Smith in that football game. You can't take away what he did in that game. He was phenomenal. However, that was a small sample size. I won't take one game and overreact. I take your whole body of work and what I had seen from Alex Smith throughout the duration of his career. And, and you kind of, you don't want to ignore what you saw in the first two or three, four seasons of Alex Smith. But you kind of take that with a grain of salt because that was pre harbor That was four coordinators in five years, Alex Smith. So you, you kind of give him a slight pass. However, that doesn't change the fact that the 49ers lost during the regular season, have been losing in past regular seasons with Alex Smith as the quarterback. And a lot of times when they lose, it's because they fall behind early and Alex Smith is not able to bring them back, which has been rearing its ugly head this year. See, last year, the recipe for success for the 49ers, get a lead, whether it be 3 nothing, 7 nothing, 10 nothing, just get a lead. Run the football. Defense is going to be extremely stingy, not give up any yardage, not give up many points. Force turnovers. Get the offense to produce points off of those turnovers, whether it be a field goal from David Akers, who was out of this world last year. I mean, the amount of field goals that he attempted and made last year, almost hard to believe. But when you're such a good defensive team, you don't care how you get points. Just keep getting points. Just keep scoring. If you have to kick six field goals and only get 18 points, that's fine by me if you're an elite defense because we're not giving up 18 points anyway. We're giving up 13. So if you kick six field goals, we get 18, and they only have 13, we win the football game. And that was the mentality of the 49ers last year. Just keep scoring points. Don't care if it's a safety. Don't care if it's a field goal. Don't care if it's a touchdown. Just keep putting points on the board. We'll do our job, and we'll help you do yours as well by getting turnovers and giving you short fields. So this year, it's a little bit different. They're falling behind in several games. Those two games that they fell behind in, they lost. And they're not being as opportunistic on defense as they were a year ago. And I told you, I was questioning whether they'd be able to do that again. I mean, the season, just like the Packers on offense, the season that the 49ers had on defense last year was insane. The amount of turnovers they were able to force from guys who hadn't been you know, turnover creators hadn't been playmakers in their career up until last year. We're talking Carlos Rogers, who was a very, very solid cover corner in his league. But in Washington, he couldn't catch a pick to save his life. Now he comes over from Washington in his first season with San Francisco, and I guess that change of scenery was what he needed because he picks the ball off six or seven times last year. Goes to the Pro Bowl, is an all-pro. And rightfully so. He had a phenomenal season. You look at their safety, Deshaun Golson, the 49ers didn't know whether to pick up his option or not. They were thinking about letting him walk in that offseason prior to the season beginning. He has an out-of-body experience at safety in 2011. He goes to the Pro Bowl. He's one of the best safeties in all of football a year ago. He's making plays left and right. And so you're going, is this the same San Francisco 49ers that I saw a year ago? Because they're not making the same plays. But it's a very good defense. Navarro Bowman, Patrick Willis, 
Those two middle linebackers are as good as it gets, and they're a tandem, so they're the best tandem in the National Football League at middle linebacker. Alden Smith is still out there roaming around trying to get to your quarterback. Justin Smith is still along that defensive front trying to cause havoc along that defensive line. And so they still have all the pieces. They're just not making as many plays as they made a year ago. But they're still stingy. They're still a good defense. And this is going to be a very good football game. And as much as we're going to talk about defenses in this game, it's going to come down to which offense makes the least amount of mistakes. What teams, and I think sometimes fans don't understand, it's okay to punt the football. You're not going to score on every possession. Don't try to press. Don't try to make a play that's not there to be made. That's when turnovers occur. It's okay to punt the football. In this game, a punt is okay because it's not a turnover. These are some very good defenses. These are very aggressive defenses. If you make a mistake, chances are you're going to have to pay for your mistakes in this game. So don't make them. If it's not there, if it's third and seven, and everyone is covered well. Your number one read on that play is double covered. You look to your second read and that's a pass over the middle. Don't be late over the middle. When you're late over the middle, you pay over the middle. So instead of you forcing something late over the middle or forcing a pass into double coverage, check it down. I don't care if it's third and nine. Check it down. Take a five-yard gain. Punt the football. Those are the type of plays that are going to win this game. The ones that are not made. The ones that are not turned into turnovers. The team that makes the least amount of mistakes in this football game on the offensive end is going to be your victor tonight. And as much as I want to say that the Seattle Seahawks could be creating a changing of the guard tonight, because I really like this Seattle Seahawks team. I really do. I just don't see them being able to go in to San Francisco and come out with a W. That is so tough to do. This is family business now. This is family business. The Seahawks weren't able to go into St. Louis and get a W. I don't see them being able to go into San Francisco and get a W. It's one thing to beat the Patriots at home. It's one thing to beat the Packers at home. It's one thing to beat the Cowboys at home. It's a totally different thing to go into somebody else's stadium, into somebody else's house, smack them around, and come out with a W. Hard for me to see you being able to do that when this is family business. That means it's personal. You guys know each other very, very well. This is intimate. This is family business. So I can't see the 49ers allowing you to come in and leave with a W. They know how big this football game is. They know that you are probably going to be the team that they're going to have to contend with to win this division. The Cardinals are 4-2. I don't think the 49ers are afraid of the Arizona Cardinals. I don't think anyone in that division is afraid of the Arizona Cardinals. They're the only team in that division without a quarterback. And so I don't think they scare anyone in that division. But these 49ers respect the Seattle Seahawks. They know what's at stake tonight, and I think they're going to take care of business. They're going to run the football. And look, even if it's not effective, you can't do what you did a week ago, which is go away from Frank Gore. I don't care if you fall behind 10 nothing in this game. You can't stop running the football because, as you saw a week ago, when you turn it over to Alex Smith, you turn it over in the football game. You have to run the football. You have to run Frank Gore. You have to run Kendall Hunter. You have to run the football, allow Alex Smith to play within the scheme, play within himself, not force it, pushing it down the field, but babysit him like you always have done. Look, it's no time to try to change your stripes. No, no time to try to change your spots. You are who you are. You're a team that babysits Alex Smith. Check down, slant, out, hitch, stop. Every now and again, you'll sprinkle in a corner route. You'll sprinkle in a wheel route up the sideline to Vernon Davis. But that's it for the most part. We're not pushing the field, the football down the field to Randy Moss. We're not pushing the football down the field to Mario Manningham for the most part. Everything is short. Everything is dink and dunk. Everything is nickel and dime. But that's who you are. 
That's your identity. A team that stays ahead of the sticks is an on-schedule, on-time offense. You find yourself in third and short a lot of times because you take what's there and you move the sticks. Now, a lot of times, your drives result in field goals because, again, it's hard to score touchdowns when your drives are 13, 14, 16 plays. But again, your defense will take points whenever they can get them. But you can't afford to abandon the game plan, which is run Frank Gore, and play off of that. Or else the Seahawks will start teeing off on Alex Smith, forcing him into errant throws, getting turnovers, and then you'll find yourself in the same boat you were in a week ago against the Giants. But I don't see you allowing that to happen. You're going to run the football. You're going to establish Frank Gore, Kendall Hunter, and your running game. You're going to make Alex Smith comfortable by a lot of short throws, a lot of easy throws, as you normally do. And on the defensive side, you have a rookie in front of you, Russell Wilson, who has been playing really good football for a rookie. But you're going to come after him. You're going to make him feel uncomfortable, as the St. Louis Rams did when he was on the road in the division. Force him into mistakes, as the St. Louis Rams did, three interceptions in that game. And you're going to try to force him to make mistakes. And I think you will. I think you'll take advantage of a few mistakes that he makes. And you will win this football game because of it. I have the San Francisco 49ers getting it done at home in a division, family business, first place at stake, getting it done 20 to 16 against the Seattle Seahawks. This is going to be a very, very, very physical ball game. Very, very intriguing matchup. One that I will not take my eyes off of, neither should you, because this is going to be a good football game that comes down to the end of the ball game. I feel confident about that. Last time I told you that when it was the NFC West game, we were disappointed. All of us, we were disappointed. Cardinals were thoroughly dominated by the Rams at home. And so now this is a game that first place is up for grabs. And if you're the 49ers, you can't drop this at home because you don't want to go to Seattle needing to win. It's, it's a difference between wanting to win and needing to win. You lose this game tonight, and, and we can forget about what transpires later on in the season. I mean, because the Seahawks could fall off the face of the earth. Marshawn Lynch could go down, and with him going down could probably be the, the hopes aspirations and dreams of the Seahawks of winning the division this year. No Marshawn Lynch probably means no Seattle Seahawks win. But forget about all of that. You lose tonight, San Francisco, and the Seahawks are, let's say, 9-6. and six. So are you. Or you're 10-5. and five. And they're 9-6. and six. As we close out the season and you guys have to meet again. And I don't know when you guys play again. Well, let's just throw out the scenario that you play on the final week of the season. You're 10 and 5, they're 9 and 6. You got to go to Seattle and come out with a W. You know how hard that is to do? Knowing in the back of your mind, we already dropped one of them. And we have to have this one because if they beat us, they win the tiebreaker, they win the division. Psychological games will be being played in this game. That's why you must win this football game. And I have you winning 20 to 16, taking your record to 5 and 2 on the season, dropping the Seattle Seahawks to 4 and 3. So that's that's a touchdown. Throw it up. We'll going to tackle on this quick extra point. Speaking of these Seattle Seahawks, <laughs> I love their defense. I've already said it. I'm going to continue to say it because I love their defense. You got to love young exuberance and brashness. They're brash. This is evident <laughs> by Richard Sherman trash talking Tom Brady. And I love it. I can't stand the Patriots. So I love anytime somebody gets a chance to stick it to the Patriots. I love it. I embrace it. And I'm pretty sure Tom Brady was joined at Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman didn't just go up to Tom Brady at the end of the game and talk trash. I'm pretty sure at some point, Richard Sherman said something to Tom Brady, and Tom Brady said, you come see me at the end of the game when it's all said and done. We'll see who's talking it. 
pretty sure Tom Brady said something along those lines. And Richard Sherman said, okay, I'll see you at the end of the game. Don't you run from me. I'll see you at the end of the game. Well, Richard Sherman proceeded to pick Tom Brady off, help his team get a victory, and at the end of the game, he made sure he went and found Tom Brady. And you know what he asked him? You mad, bro? <laughs> you mad? Gotcha. And, and, you, and you know what Tom Brady did? Said absolutely nothing because he couldn't because they just lost the football game. You got to love it. Got to love guys who are confident about what they do and they go out and execute. They go out and play ball. It's okay when Philip Rivers talks trash, when he talks smack, but he goes out and shreds you for 339 yards, three touchdowns, and no interceptions. It's okay. When you start turning the ball over six times in one game, four interceptions, two fumbles, I don't want to hear your mouth. I don't want to hear what you got to say. Richard Sherman went and got it done on the field. He's been doing that all last year, all this year. So if he wants to talk a little trash, give off a little swag, I'm down with it. I love this Seattle Seahawks defense because they're physical. They're, they're corners. They're coming up to you. Line of scrimmage. I'm big. I'm 6'4". He's 6'3". We're pressing you at the line of scrimmage. You're not getting off with a free release. No, no, no. You're not getting off the line of scrimmage with a free release. You're going to earn this catch if you get it. And I'm going to jack you up the whole way. So, no, it's going to be physical. Wes Welker found out the hard way last week. He took some shots last week. Brandon Browner sitting in cover two, waiting on him. Tom Brady led him into a, and that was Tom Brady's fault. You don't throw it out in cover two knowing that there's a corner out there. And these corners are like safeties. They're 6'3 and 6'4 respectively. They're big and they're physical. So it's like being hit by a safety. He led him with an out. You don't throw the out in cover two. Right into a corner that's waiting out in the flats. You don't do that. Set Wes Welker up and Wes Welker took a shot. Had to go sit down, get a little bit of the smell of sauce, shake him up a little bit, gave him a concussion test. He was okay, came back in the game. Cam Chancellor lit Wes Welker up later on in the game. And again, this is what you have to do with the Patriots. You got to be physical. And this is a physical bunch of the Seattle Seahawks. So this is going to be a very interesting game. But I just thought I'd let you know that uh, Richard Sherman was talking trash to Tom Brady. And it was funny. I really enjoyed that because, again, when you're good, you need to have that kind of swagger, that kind of aura about yourself. We're good. I know we're good. And we're going to show you that we're good. That's how you have to be if you want to be elite in this league. One more note. So I guess this is a two-point conversion. I just made it a two-point conversion today. The Eagles finally got rid of their defensive coordinator, Juan Castillo. And when it, before the season started, when I did the lab reports on every team in the league, that was one of the questions I posed. Why is Juan Castillo still your defensive coordinator? Why? I didn't get an answer. Never got an answer. And now that you've come up on your bye and you're underachieving in this season so far, you want to fire Juan Castillo? Is that the answer now? Not saying that you're trying to use him as a scapegoat because the defense... Hasn't really been struggling, but they did give it up against the Detroit Lions in the, at the end of that football game. But I think the offense is more the issue than the defense right now. So while firing him, I think, was a good idea, I question your timing. Did you need to do it right now? You should have did it last year. That should have been done at the end of the season last year. People are giving Andy Reid credit for cutting his losses and admitting he made a mistake. No, I'm not giving him credit for that because if he would have admitted he made a mistake before the season started, which he was supposed to, got rid of him then, then I could give him some credit because sometimes you want your ego to shine through. You want to be right. We all do. Everybody wants to be right. Everyone likes validation. I tell you something, I want that to come to fruition so I can say, I told you so. Told you I'm a big I told you so guy. So is Andy Reid. But he was wrong. Most coaches around the league are I told you so guys. That's how they got their head coaching jobs. Because they're right about things. They're good at what they do. They make some moves that you probably wouldn't have made. But they pan out and they go I told you so. 
Well, Andy was wrong on this one. But I don't know if firing him right now was the answer because, again, I don't think the defense was the problem right now. I think that offense is where you have to point the finger. The defense isn't the one that has 17 turnovers in only six games. That's not the defense is doing. The defense is not the one fumbling the football, throwing interceptions, putting the defense in precarious situations by turning the football over in their own territory. That's not what the defense is doing. That's the offense is doing. The, the defense isn't neglecting to feed LaShawn McCoy the football, one of the best running backs in all of football. That's the offense is doing. That's the head coach is doing. So I don't know if I agree with the timing of the move, even though I agree with the move itself. I don't think the defense was the problem right now. I think the offense is. So what are you going to do to fix that problem? You're going to fire yourself? Doubt it. No, I don't doubt it. I know you're not going to fire yourself. So I don't know if that was the right move or not, but again, that should have been done last season. Doing an in-season move, I'm not a fan of that. Because what does that do for you? That next guy you bring in, I'm pretty sure you're just moving a court, some kind of uh, def defensive line or linebackers coach. You're just sliding him up. What does that really do? You take a guy who's had a narrow focus all season, just focusing on one position, and now he has to open up and look at the whole broad picture. He has to look at the whole spectrum now. I need to focus on the D-backs. I need to focus on the linebackers. I need to focus on the line as a whole now. All you did was put some more on someone's plate that wasn't prepared to have that on their plate. At week seven of the season. Don't agree with the move at this time. And let's see what it does for you. I venture to say that your defense actually gets worse from this move. But we'll see. And that's going to do it for this episode of In the Lab Room. I thank you for joining me. Want to hear from you. Drop something in the inbox at inthelabroom at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook. Like the page. In the Lab Room is the Facebook page. Every single episode I've ever done on Facebook. So check that out. Like the page again. I'm on Twitter. At In the Lab Room is the Twitter handle. Hit me up on Twitter. Again, I check these very frequently. So if you drop something in there, I will get back to you. So I thank you for joining me on this episode of In the Lab Room. Let's get off to a good start. The lab is looking to get off to a good start this week. So I need the 49ers to step up to the plate and get it done tonight. Last week, it was a house of horrors for me, and it all started with Thursday with the Steelers going down to the Tennessee Titans. Let's not have a repeat of that. Let's get off on the right foot, or in this case, get off on the left foot. I'm left-handed. So I don't get down with all the left or right-handed talk. I'm left-handed. So let's get off on the left foot this time. Last week, I got off on the right foot, which was the wrong foot. Let's get off on the left foot. And I thank you for joining me on this episode of In the Lab Room. I'm your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me. Enjoy the game tonight, as I will. We'll come back. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Go over all, A-L-L, -L, all of the remaining games on the slate, with the exception of one, that being the Redskins game. Or, actually, I made a mistake, the exception of two. Because I won't go over the Redskins game. That will be in the Redskins report. And I won't go over the Monday night matchup as we will do that on Monday preceding that game. So, again, thank you for joining me. I want to see you back here tomorrow. Same time. Same place. Also remember, at the conclusion of this episode, the last time you hear my voice, you will see what the lab has been doing over the course of the season, including what we did last week and including who the sole survivor of this week is. Thank <laughs> you.